let me begin very quickly by saying a few words about the big idea of the course and what we mean by a megastructure in this context. Um, what I'm interested in, the, so the stack book, which I talked a fair bit about in the last uh, master class and we'll refer to in this one a bit, makes this argument that planetary scale computation in its various forms and guises and scales constitutes something like an accidental megastructure, something that we've compo that has been engineered quite deliberately at certain scales and has come together, assembled itself rather undeliberately, uh, even accidental and in sort of undirected emergent ways at, at other scales. And in this, the term megastructure, when I use this, I mean it rather both um, very specifically and rather and generically. Um, in the generic sense, I mean any form a sort of inhabitable form that tries, that is, that attempts to and we assume succeeds to some degree in encapsulating some form of, of an enclosed metabolism, let's say. That there's a kind of closed loop that is possible within that megastructure. Within the boundary of the envelope, an entire world may, might be contained. There's a reason, and, and if you think of it in this way, um, part of the rationale or the impetus, the, the desire around the megastructural form, particularly in the 1960s and 1970s, which we'll talk about, was closely aligned with um, a kind of utopian thinking about the possibility for the redesign not only of architecture and of landscapes and the forms of habitation, but a redesign of society itself, such that to redesign the building system in which and upon which, through which a, a society taken as a whole uh, would mean to redesign that society itself. And this utopian logic, um, which a utopian discourse, which goes back, of course, quite, you know, at least to Plato's Republic, um, is, is one in which the figure of enclosure uh, and totality is, always plays a very central role. You think, we, we think of Thomas More's Utopia from the 15, 6, 1516, which takes place on an island, as an island. Utopias tend to be within a uh, all of the genres, literature, film, and politics, withdrawn, islands, complete, singular, bounded, bordered, spatial entities in which all of the forms and movements, events, uh, connections, and flows that might constitute the society in which and on which uh, that, that uses this, this bounded entity as its, as its scaffold or, and its enclosure, its, its skin might work, uh, can, be, uh, can be understood, can be captured, and can be uh, remade in some, if not a zero-sum fashion, uh, at least one in which the, 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 control, the control mechanisms are, are available, or they presumed to be available in this way. And this is what I mean by closed metabolism. Um, now, in the generic sense um, of this, we mean it um, uh, is something in which it, 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 a kind of an organization or assemblage of forms and forces, material and immaterial, causes and effects, at this uh, extreme scale that may or may not actually be bounded in a physical sense by a specific physical envelope. And so what we're looking at more specifically then are what we might call non-architectural megastructures. And so the stack model has been proposed is one uh, sort of schema to think about these non-architectural megastructures. And by this I mean things that are both sort of very abstract and also very close at hand. Things like supply chain systems logistical networks, ways in which that the very specific organization, assemblage, coming to form, organization of real 
substance, matter, into the objects that inhabit the world with us uh, is a very precisely designed and engineered compositional uh, project, uh, one with which and around which our society makes itself, but one which is not contained by a, a single epidermal envelope in the same way the, uh, uh, the, the 60s and 70s megastructural forms were. In the simplest sense, uh, or in this more perhaps deceptively simple sense, part of the interest for the seminar is to take a look at what we know and don't know, what we think we know, what we think we don't know, what we know we think we don't know, so forth, about those now canonical projects of the 60s and 70s, Super Studio, ArcaZoom, Arctogram, early OMA, Yona Friedman, so forth. Thinking about their successes and failures, their durability, their capacity to continue to inspire our, our thinking, how it is that they may have been built or not built nevertheless, um, and take all of that, those things that we know and apply that knowledge to these non-architectural, so an interpretation of these non-architectural megastructures and see what that allows us to, what sort of patterns that allows us to deduce. To think of these non-architectural forms as if they were architectural forms, to see them in this way and to deduce them, to deduce them and, and, and analyze them in this way. And the second hunch, which I'll speak to in a moment, um, or maybe more than a hunch, maybe it's a, a pattern that we can deduce, is that in the utopian aspiration of this, these earlier projects, to remake the entire world at once by remaking a kind of monadic miniature of the world within a single encapsulated enveloping form, tended, like all totalities tend to do, utopian totalities tend to do, to sour into a kind of dystopian outcome, totalitarian or ruin or what have you. And in a certain sense, some of these projects did get built in different ways than we might have anticipated. But again, the argument is that if these utopian forms have this tendency to dissolve toward a dystopian that one spectrum tends to slide towards the other, that the inverse is potentially, we hope, equally true, and that the dystopian megastructures that we surround ourselves with, architectural and non-architectural, have an equal capacity to invert themselves into something that we could identify as um, a utopian imaginary, or at least one in which the, uh, the notion of understanding the, a social, the society as a totality that it's available to our design thinking, it's available to our political intervention, that's available to our aspirations, um, is something that's uh, thinkable again. So I'm gonna, the, the talk that I'm gonna do here will be divided into two sections. One in which um, I'm gonna sort of go through and make um, a bit of a, a sort of historical and interpretive argument about some of these megastructures that we're discussing. Um, some of this is from, some of it but not all of it is from that log article that was uh, the excerpt from the stack and some of it's from other things but not, not the parts of that article that I've already discussed here. And then the second half I'm going to, um, I'm going to read a text that will focus us a bit more closely on this, um, the oscillation between the utopian and dystopian, the aspiration for this and the role ultimately of, of violence in the design logic of both of those. All right, so let me begin with this. Um, this is, uh, this is a, a part of the, the Golbeki Tepe temple, um, which was unearthed in uh, Turkey um, some years ago. It's a, from what it was, does, it was designed um, it was built over a period of several generations um, in uh, 12,000, uh, I believe 13,000 to uh, 14,000 to 12,000 BC was the time period of this. So l before the large settlement of um, the normalization of, of agriculture and agricultural civilization in the city fort in the city wall building fortifications. So th this 
structure was a kind of hunter-gatherer megastructure. Um, a huge temple on the landscape that uh, nomadic hunter-gatherer groups would organize themselves, we assume as a kind of honing beacon on the distance to give some geographic, territorial directionality to it. Um, different bones found on the site suggest there were different forms of animal sacrifices. Um, and so it's assumed that the, the temple was used as some kind of interface, gateway, um, central uh, symbolic mechanism for the uh, negotiations of life and death and the cycles of the, of the year and the day and of the, the proto-societies that were there, that, that were thereby emerging. This is a map from, this is a drawing from um, 1516, Thomas More's um, famous book, Utopia or No Place, uh, in which he lays out his scheme for an ideal society, which as mentioned, uh, begins and ends on an island. And the island image uh, not only provides a kind of natural envelope or membrane that could surround and encapsulate that totality. Um, it, it also provides, at least graphically, um, in its planometric logic, a kind of um, limit to the diagram by which not only the space is subdivided and subprogrammed according to different kinds of, of, um, of uh, uh, ideal arrangements, but that the programming of, this, of society itself can be subdivided and, and, and diagrammed in such a way that logical relationships and ideal hierarchies between them are represented not only in the drawing, um, but in, the, in and upon the landscape itself, which is, as we know, um, either in plan or section, a basic, a basic technique of how megastructures uh, represent themselves. Today it's a bit more difficult in this regard in identification of those forms because, as I say, the the, the contiguity or materiality of the megastructural systems with which we engage the world or with we compose the world are ones in which um, the safe uh, the, the safe capture and and uh, enclosure contiguity uh, of space is not one that's necessarily available to us. This is as you know this is of course the one Wilshire building just down the street from us where, as you all know, is now the uh, I still think I still believe the largest uh, telco switching node uh, in, in Southern California. It used to be a bank, now it's full of servers. All of the internet that we get runs through this particular building. This is, is and is not our version of the Golbeki Tepe temple. It is the central mechanism around which those symbolic negotiations must be mediated as we move around our own landscapes as hunters and gatherers of different kinds of, of um, uh, hunters and gatherers with the different, sets, different sets of interests. But it's one in which we're, we're not only allowed to ignore uh, as we move around the world, but are, are, it's widely, broadly suggested to us that we, um, we ignore it. If you try to go into one Wilshire, tell them you want to walk around, you'll be uh, discouraged um, from, from doing so. Um, and also because the kind of, the, the, let's say, the, the information space, the infosphere that it mediates, unlike the one at, at Golbeki Tepe, is one in which um, uh, has a very different relationship to, to the materiality of information, electromagnetic spectrum, and all the rest of this, such that those, con those connections and, and associations are massively dispersed, um, virtualized, deterritorialized, and so forth. And yet, it's, it's real, and those forms do cohere around us, um, but one that it's, it's harder for an architectural imaginary to, get to perhaps um, understand as a building problem, even if it may be easy for us um, to think of it as a diagrammatic problem, um, and, and how it impacts us and, and, the, and the world around us. It, bec it becomes an infosphere that, um, that, that permeates the, the substances and membranes and capacities of the city around us as computation becomes not a type of object in the world, but a generic substance that causes any object in the world to behave and communicate and take on a, 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 a life of its own, independent of how it may have operated otherwise, such as electricity did in the past. 
and it, aggregating up to the urban scale, it turns those, the cities in which we locate into a kind of um, switching mechanisms in ways in which they have been, uh, one extent have always been, and in, in, in other respects are only beginning to learn how to be. Um, and this is part of the argument that I make around this for the city layer of the stack. Those of you who weren't in the class last quarter, you may want to look um, at some of the lectures we did where I explained that, the terminology um, a bit more. Uh, 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 and, or the log piece will give you uh, probably most of that you need in here as well. Um, there's another way, perhaps, if we begin to talking about representation uh, within architecture, that the logic of the megastructure um, had in, had, returns in strange, in strange particular ways, or returns to us not through an understanding or interest within of, of scale for its own sake, or of the sovereignty of the envelope as a primary question, but really one of representational, um, representational convenience. Uh, there's a way in which, I mean, we know, uh, historians of technology will tell us, and it's an obvious truism, that the way in which we, a society is, builds its tools and builds its, its buildings, builds its habitats and so forth, is contingent on the technology that that society has in order to do that. When, when you have steel, you can build skyscrapers. When you only have adobe, you build something else. And so the, the, the engineering and design imaginary is limited by the tools at hand. But the same is true in many respects of the models that we make. Design is, as we know, uh, primarily in many respects, about building and, de and, and, and defining and composing the model that would somewhere down the line potentially be simulated and extruded into a real thing. But the way in which we build models is also dependent on the technologies at hand. And so the capacity for the model itself to become something in the world is dependent on the tools that we have to build those models, and that's why you can look at late 90s buildings and say that's a Form Z building or that's a, this was done this way. You can read, like you used to be able to read, to, to, to know when, uh, what year a pop song came out by the sound of the drum machine. You can read build, you can read the CAD in particular buildings in certain sorts of ways. All right. With this in mind, I wanted, it was an observation I was uh, sort of ruminating on on the train ride up here today about how it is, at, at what, trying to, fig to figure out um, where it is, when, at what point the satellite perspective became so predominant within um, architect particularly architectural student presentations and reviews. There's a point in time where one might come to a school where plan section elevation and a physical, you know, Mike Brady model would be what you needed to sort of provide. But at a certain point, and of course, logically determinous with the general availability of Google Earth, satellite became the fourth perspective, um, or fifth, if you like, um, by which every project had to. Uh, advocate for its advocate for itself, and in this, the what we might think of the face of the building, the face or the faciality of the structure, uh, shifted perspective. Whereas the faciality within architectural representation was traditionally something was the business of elevation, uh, of an ele elevation perspective became instead that of of, of satellite, and you became very clear. Um, here's of course Rogers Millennium Dome. Um, buildings that understood, buildings that were designed in a way to understood to be looking up, to that th would thought of themselves in a way as geoglyphs. You know the, you know the primarily in, in many respects the sort of pre-Columbian um, American geoglyphs, these large inscriptions in the in the rock that are still around in Chile and Peru and parts of it, and in Central and North America as well. These writings in the landscape they're meant to be read and interpreted from some supervisory perspective up in the sky, even by civilizations that never had the capacity to actually see the Earth from that perspective, they could at least imagine that perspective. These geoglyphs, sort of model of the face of architecture, uh, have become uh, an increasingly important part of the way which we understand them, and it's just the, the logic of the face of the building itself, where something like Disney Hall has a, 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 you know, there's a particular face it may present from Grand Avenue. If you look at it from the top, it's in, largely indistinguishable from a Best Buy or a Walmart, um, uh, because of the way in which the the roof is dealt with as a as something as a kind of backstage that no one would ever look at, as opposed to the face as opposed to the face itself. Now, things like this, airports um, in which and other sort of secure facilities in which a, a much a much more comprehensive encapsulation of a miniaturized world are located. 
uh, are ones in which that geoglyphic, um, that geoglyphic logic is more pronounced, but perhaps one in which the pictogrammatic um, uh, interests are more accidental or emergent than, than deliberative. Um, at another scale, we see how the entire uh, urban, we can read sort of the entire urban civilization um, as a kind of composite uh, geoglyphs at once. So I'll begin to re-dive re into this. Um, the image of global urbanity as a contiguous body implies a dramatic shift in scale from the merely regional footprint to the whole spherical planetary surface. We have no shortage of imagery depicting planetary urban networks, especially at night. There's a throbbing weave of light, of light, life, movement, and what telecommunications company can make it through any fiscal quarter without advertising itself in this way in, in a TV commercial. It's less clear, however, um, what this obligatory geography might communicate other than to communicate communication itself. And so unlike the, for example, the Incan geoglyphs of pre-Columbian Chile, the urban weave, the global urban weave has no, has no pictographic content per se to be read in, a, in, a, in, a, in some specific way from above. And unlike the earth art and maps, speculative maps of Robert Smithson, for example, it makes no particular pedagogic point about geologic time and perspective. The contiguity um, of this urban neural network draws instead on what we might call an aesthetic of logistics. Um, and, from, and from that, an admiring contentment uh, with networks as a perhaps n nearly sacralized form of, form of form and format. And in these renderings, networks, uh, networks more than cities uh, are what is perhaps monumentalized. And the implication, I think, is plain, that we are those who have wrapped the planet in wire. This is the signal accomplishment of our time. Our pyramids are gossamer shaped. While the investing infrastructure with, in, well, and, and while investing infrastructure with deep monumental significance is not unique, obviously, the planetary scope of this urban network, if understood not just as links between nodes, but as itself a vast durable apparatus, suggests a change in the local to global telescoping uh, between uh, anthropometric human scale habitat uh, and the wider urban landscape. And so um, our discussion within the stack operates, uh, understands the city layer then as, as part of this massively distributed megastructure, as I say, um, and would in to do so argue that we would want to draw upon, however obliquely our strategies would demand it, uh, previous and even the utop utopian megastructural projects of the past and understand how they have been realized, perhaps perversely, perhaps inverted from their original content, but realized nevertheless, which I'll speak to again in a moment. Now, especially around the years when the first photographs of Earth taken from space uh, were widely distributed, late 1960s, early 1970s, Speculative architecture spawned many of today's, what I, uh, are today's canonical projects of the utopian megastructural type, inspired by the visual scale of a grasping earth as the figure in this infinite ground, as a comprehensive and singular site condition. In some cases, these may be uh, seen uh, as proposing truly utopian spaces, total islands cut off from the world, um, including OMA's Voluntary Prisoners of Architecture of 1971, Super Studios' Planet Spanning Continuous Monument, uh, 1967 or so, roughly through 1977, while others sought the utopian through the maximal perforation of boundaries at that Earth scale, um, or and, and others through a kind of ludic interface of maximal grids. Um, Arkazum's No Stop City really began in the very early 1960s, or, and Constance New Babylon, uh, also 1960s through, or 62, I think, through the um, uh, late 70s. 
One is about enclosure, one is about maximum perforation. They both are uh, uh, images of totality is the point. Um, the merger of or the merger of cities into a kind of planetary scale conglomerations uh, was imagining you know, Constantine's Diodocus, the Ecumenopolis, um, among others, um, or as a single urban form comprising the entire world, as for a Palo Solarian arcology. These continental scale cities rising, even up into the atmosphere, and we see um, so we see that the impetus for the um, these such these sort of separate. Uh, for such separate and massive planetary scale propositions may have appeared in, in both positive or negative relationship to um, you know, the Buckminster Fuller-esque modeling of the Earth as a single spaceship, right? This is still half a generation after, after um, Fuller's uh, notion of spaceship Earth, um, as a single design problem, and its ecology, that is the Earth's ecology, as a single independent web of life that might be, that, that would demand a scaling up and out of the architectural, in, the architectural intelligence of the envelope uh, to meet this new an understanding of an ecological scale that is independent of the anthropometric scale that we may have previously understood to be the, per, the, the, the permit and purview of the habitat making business. And in such a way, these projects of the of the Apollo of the Apollo era megastructure, let's call them, as an Apollo space program, uh, provide a kind of missing link in a way between the uh, the progressive megastructures of high modernity, such as the massive Karl Marxhof in Vienna, um, a neighborhood-sized building, 1930, with over 1,300 apartments. Um, think the Maltzen thing next door. Um, uh, uh, and, pro and from the, that, on the one hand, two programs for extra, extra planetary colonies on Mars, uh, perhaps I think best articulated uh, by Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars trilogy books. They were attempts to see the whole as a whole, part of, and part of the desire for totality, important to any utopian social project, and dystopian anxiety. Um, but also, in many cases, um, the proposal for the wholesale replacement of an existing geopolitical order of nested individuated buildings, cities and states, with some new model of a biopolitical program, perhaps along a continuum. We can see some of these. I'm proposing this continuum for the, how this would imagine this emergent order. Some kind of central architectural, strong architectural authority that programs that totality on the one, say, something like voluntary prisoners, Exodus, OMA project, to the open ludic field of, an un, of a non authoritarian uh, programmatic form, perhaps New Babylon on the, on the other end of that spectrum, uh, and for which the position and imp imposition of the megastructural form is in service to that new spatial order. Um, and, and then one assumes as it's sort of as a prototype for this larger, properly global scale society. Now, the, the urban form of the, um, the, the urban form of the, uh, the city layer for the stack, um, as, we've, as, as we've discussed, ha has to be understood today, uh, we're skipping ahead from 68 to 2015, um, has to be understood today as both, a, as both a physical and virtual material and informational in its materiality. It's an interweaving of the physical and informational infrastructures at a given site, as well as a kind of differentiated integration and disintegration of continental urban sites. So it's, it's, it, the, the way in which the, we think, it must think about the site within this function for this uh, type of possibility of megastructural uh, projection today, to be clear, is both in the, the, the one in which any given site is defined by the interweaving of, the, of the, the, the physical and the informational, and that the site is understood both as an instance within a larger global context and uh, a singular site on its own regard with its own unique and ecological niche, and that those two mixtures sometimes are at odds and sometimes complementary. In some sense, the, its logics, that is, those of today, are extensive, con continuous with those of the Apollo, Apollo era architectural mega-utopianism, the total envelope, 
universal interfacial grids, superimposition of quasi-sovereign layers, and so on. And in some senses, they're almost the complete inversion of these. Regularization of production, as opposed to an opening, uh, and consumption cycles, a strong filtering of, of individual mobility, an intensive capitalization of every encounter and gesture, and so forth. And for this, we could trace the, with this in mind, both the ways in which they continue and discontinue those lineages, we could trace the after images of these megastructures into their operations, of those 60s era megastructures, into their operations within the 60s, within, within the operations of the city layer today, and even recognize the appearance of something like their evil doppelgangers. This is possible because the stack itself is not, is, is, not only, is not only itself a megastructure and an arc of totalization, it is a platform for totalities, other totalities in which to install themselves and to, and to operate on their, as they will, to superimpose and interweave totalities. And like any platform, it can work as both a control mechanism and a means, um, a control mechanism and a means for opening and flattening access at the same time, or both. And in fact, one because the other. And it is not in the least surprising then, I would argue, that we find that in the distant legacy of these canonical megastructures um, would be qualified, that, that, that the canonical actually would be qualified by the reversibility of their aspiration. That, it, that is to say that we shouldn't be surprised because of the, the way in which the stack operates as a, log as a platform for further totalities that in the lineage from these early megastructures to the conditions in which we might identify ones today, that it's precisely the reversibility of the sovereign logic of those forms, what either strong or weak, open or closed, that would define that lineage and particularly define the reversibility of the utopian and the dystopian uh, as the basis for our picking up the thread or leaving it be. Uh, examples, I think, are not so difficult to point out. We could, first, we could consider Foxconn as a megastructure. Um, Foxconn, as we know, the largest private employer in China, which assembles much of the human scale digital electronic equipment that connects all the rest of urban society to the, that connects urban society to the rest of the stack. The largest factory is in Longhua, is in Longhaus in Shenzhen, um, which in, in situates um, something like 450,000 employee residents in a massive live work complex. One might also say that it's an island and therefore um, available for both utopian and, and as perhaps been more the case, dystopian uh, imaginations. And taken as an inversion uh, along some dialectical spectrum of platform open enclosure, the regimented lifestyle, uh, regimented cycle of life passing from one phase to another, perhaps until death of those worker residents. Foxconn could, could be seen as a dotted line from Exodus, voluntary prisoners, right? You know, the AMA project, the OMA project, you begin your life at one end of the building, you end your life at the, neck, at the, at the other end as you go through. Same as Foxconn in a way. The factory floor is responsible for the physical assemblage of the world's primary consumer devices, laptops, smartphones, and as these are the phys essential physical interfaces between users in motion and the recombinant landscapes that we strategize, it's also, in a way, a realization of Archigram's plug-in city, uh, of Archigram's plug-in city, or later there, uh, or a couple years earlier, the computer city. We see perhaps the essential form of Super Studios Continuous Monument realized in, so here's No Stop City again. I also just to pause here as well. I, I know most of you have seen these as well, but it's worth noting for any research that hasn't, is that um, these, amazing, these amazing conceptualizations of, the inf of, a, of an urbanism based on the, the definition and extrapolation of an infinite grid that define Arcazoom's No Stop City, which in many ways I think is the most important of the, these projects from this era. The original versions of these are, of course, done with a manual typewriter, um, which is always continues to be amazing to me. Um, we trace these, we trace these um, to, so, sorry, from Super Studios continu Continuous Monument is realized in many ways by Global Crossings and other telecommunications companies from the 19th, early 2000s, massive deployment of transoceanic fiber optics 
uh, during the dot-com frenzy, linking the continents together in this um, uh, in these physical linear uh, assemblages and connections. The former project, the former Super Studios was a project, was, was successful as a project, though unbuilt. Um, the latter, the telecoast fiber optic lines were built, but perhaps unsuccessful as a project. We sense traces of no stop city in the absolute speed, of am absolute ambulatory speed of urban computing, the interfacial city without beginning or end or middle. We imagine Cedric Price's fun palace turned inside out as North Korean, there's more, no subsidy, turned inside out as North Korean stadium pageants, where the audience is the content, but instead of, be, sorry, but instead of being free to improvise, um, instead of being free to improvise, the audience is the content, but instead of being free to improvise, each is instead rendered into a disciplined pixel in a larger choreographic display. How is Yona Friedman's La Ville Spatiale ancestral to the new Asian smart cities, such as New Songdo City, uh, um, the new ubiquitous city, says the brochure, in South Korea's Incheon development, or Soleri's Arcology for that matter? How much is uh, Arcology a rough sketch for Foster's that's Norman Foster's uh, Mazdar, the massive green smart city in Abu, Dhab Abu Dhabi, uh, built with the, uh, with the collaborators of Cisco and IBM. Is the situationist cut and paste psychogeography realized or crushed by Minecraft? What links the hyper-libertarian secessionist interests of the Seasteading Institute, which would provide for, the whole, the, for whole populations to live offshore on massive ships floating from port to port. Uh, Peter Thiel, the Facebook co-founder, is, is uh, fu early funder, is, is the, also the funder of the Seasteading Institute, by the way. What links the Seasteading Institute with Archigram's Walking City project from 1967, which plotted Star Wars-like landwalker city machines to get up an amble away to greener pastures as needed? For that matter, how to link Cisco and NASA's uh, Planetary Skin uh, Institute uh, which would blanket the globe's epidermal crust with ubiquitous physical sensors on the one hand uh, and the Death Star on the other. And, as, any, and as, um, as you should probably know, the Death Star, like an animal brain uh, for the Death Star, the most important information processing and mission critical tasks all takes place on the outer surface of the sphere, on the skin. Palm Jeremiah, Tatlin's Tower, the USS Enterprise, the Pentagon, Noah's Ark, Corb's Plan de Paris, Sim City. It gets harder and harder to keep all of these mega gardens separate. So, um, the Obama era coming to a close, but if we think back those eight, long eight years ago, the Obama era um, at its beginning saw a new wave for infrastructural design and, and, and uh, investment. As the over-leveraged real estate um, the, in the wake of what in the early 2000s was called the Bilbao effect and those sorts of projects, all of which was supposed to give way to massive public spending on large built systems that actually did things instead. But the new New Deal didn't happen, as we know. For some, attention then turned to the cheap fix of uh, uh, compressed natural gas over renewables, for, and for others for actually preventing infrastructural investment in, for example, airport expansion or tar sands pipelines or things of the sort. For the most part, um, this infrastructural, infrastructuralism of that era so at less to mitigate the dangers of algorithmic capital, anthropocenic growth, than to update or innovate on their existing armatures. You could think of, um, again, Norman Foster's Beijing Airport, which was built, versus the North Sea wind farms proposed by OMA at the same time not built, as an example. And around this time of Obama's second inauguration, we received word that uh, Foster had received the most extraordinary commission. His office was asked to work with the European Space Agency to design structures to be 3D printed on the moon. 
the prospect of constructing a new civilization from whole cloth on nearby planets and moons, of course, has inspired no, no shortage of utopian schemes. And in this case, the cloth is lunar soil itself, uh, which might be used as the essential building matter from which off-Earth hibernations and habitations might be composed. In this, um, this is um, robotic terraforming as much as it is off-planet urbanism. Instead of shipping building supplies across the vacuum of space, the mission is instead to send programs, call them what you want, scripts, recipes, algorithms, which used by a robotic 3D printer would build up new structures layer by layer using lunar soil itself as the print material, in time filling the sunny southern lunar pole with new architectures. And I think the choice of, uh, of Foster's office for this project, like, like this, is, um, is of course not un unexpected, as he is arguably, in some respects, for better or worse, the preeminent architect of the Google Earth era. Foster might terraform the moon because he has already, project by project, terraformed Earth. The corollary of this, the artificial totality in this is ecological. From Mazdar to the new Reichstag to the Gherkin, few of any other contemporary offices uh, have done more to expand the perspectival scale of architectural figuration um, to, with the preeminence of the satellite perspective than his. As said, students in, are, are, are in many ways now obligated to include satellite view along with elevation, axon, and so forth. And his project perhaps suggests one reason why. Um, Foster's projects, um, like to take the, continue the example, um, can perhaps be only properly understood or considered read well from tens of thousands of feet in the air. And as landscape scale interventions in relation to the regions that they gather onto their midst, as megastructures, they draw they, they drop uh, in, into their midst now. As megastructures, they draw uh, logics of totality one into the other. The scale of the project suggests a gathering of that social totality, again, of the society that would inhabit this itself into this single staged and desired envelope. In this case, one drawn from above, of seen in situation, seen as a organismic diagram. as opposed to, for example, in section, as for Albrecht Dürer's woodcut of Maximilian, uh, the, the Palace of the Soviets, um, or, CC, or OMA CCTV, all of which are also operating in the same kind of form of a situated, uh, a situated closed metabolism, uh, for which the envelope enclosure intakes utopian aspirations of the client and of the public in processes them, displays them, and, and, and puts them in motion as an architectural mega machine. So the universal platform of, of the smart city, for example, such as, again, Mazdar, um, is one that attempts to gather the world into itself less through the anthropometric technique of the envelope, however, than through the anticipatory and parametric management of the discrete energy event. By circumscribing and rationalizing a local polity of electrons as the core constituency of urban governance, this smart city model seeks to create a closed ecology of electrons and molecules, governed by and f uh, for which the governmental rhetorics of the mega dashboard might provide some complete managerial indexicality to the urban metabolism that drives preference for green infrastructural systems that can regulate data suitable to the macroscopic total images of flow. Another case in point then is Foster's unbuilt Crystal Island project in Moscow. A massive 27 million square foot project, four times the size of the Pentagon. Hyperboloid Christmas tree-like tower would gather a myriad of residential, cultural, and educational programs under its glass skin. In her essay on the project, um, Keller Easterling uh, begins by linking Foster's project to those utopian schemes of yesterday. 
Um, some, as I say, now registered as part of our canon, other uh, still languishing in the historical jungle pile of unacknowledged visionary cranks. Foster's secessionist island in Moscow, however, like Mazdar, recommends itself as an exemplar of green architecture in that it can generate its, all, its own energy, um, allows for carbon, uh, carbon light uh, internal transportation from home to work to leisure, a centralized economy of scale and density for the importation and consumption of resources and so on. Easterling's critique, however, draws on the say, slaughter Dykean definition of our, of our given planetary condition as one of vast interlocking interiors uh, and argues that capital A architecture uh, response to the challenge of the Anthropocene is not properly met by such financial bubble era archaeological monuments. We may disagree, we may not. It may be that the policy of the mega density will drive the development of larger and larger buildings, like the larger and larger bombs of the 1950s and the larger and larger airplanes of the 1970s, both races won, by the way, by the, by the Soviets with the absurd, so here we have Fuller Foster, Fuller Foster with Crystal Island, both of these races for the biggest were won by the Soviets at the time, the, 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 the 50 megaton Tsar Bomba um, and the 300 foot Antonov 225, never put to any particular direct use. Uh, and now Moscow, if Crystal Island was ever to be built, it could add to this collection of hypertrophic trophies. And it may well be then that the scalar cal recalibration of the built interior will have some positive effect on, on by drawing more and more networks uh, and territories within one building's single intelligent interfacial design scheme. Even so, the proper architectural address of the design challenges of the Anthropocene and the permanent ecological exception remains with the, con remains with the conceptual recalibration, the shift in thinking that the planet itself is already, is already the megastructural mega totality in which the possibility and program of total design might work. We already are inside the megastructure. We always have been. The real design problem, then, is not the authority of a new envelope visible from space, but the redesign of the program that organizes interiority into which we are all thrown together. We are, we are all floating in space, yes. Here, the architecture the architectural imaginary, plan, section, processual diagram, become key techniques for the prototyping of the governance of what would result from this reprogramming and the possibility of a subtractive, not additive architecture as the essence of speculative infrastructural work. There is no expansion of a single building that can do this. Architecture is therefore perhaps the wrong metaphor for architecture to lean on. The architectural imaginary now shifts from what the professionalists, from the professional assembly of buildings and what that has asked of it to the conceptual and technological assembly of territory itself. And so in groping towards what the governance and geopolitics of this might look like, especially in regard to the ecological exception, we realize that Foster's buildings are simply way too small. Instead, we would do better to draw energy from, another, from other artificial envelopes um, that does less to subdivide specific program than to enable the appearances of programs we cannot already anticipate, rent, and resell in advance. An envelope based not on the metaphor of the arc, but on that of the atmosphere and on the scale and ubiquity of the clouds. So... Our first discussion, um, this in relationship to those things, we understood that uh, was indicated in a way by our common situation within these various channels and envelopes, and that the connection and disconnection between individuals, uh, sites, and cities within these regional transcontinental networks exceeds geographic position and makes explicit that one is not only within the specific city that you happen to be standing in at any particular point in time, but are located inside a general urban fabric that torques and folds around the planet, connected and served at various points 
through various apertures and orifices and, and, and black rect and illuminated black rectangles. In this, some have a relation, some megastructures have a unique relationship to other megastructures. Not only cause and effect doppelgangers, um, but contemporary doppelgangers as well. They rely upon, even in their withdrawal, their, with their, their interest to withdraw as um, objects, to withdraw as, as, as enveloped entities, to withdraw as monadic social totalities, they rely upon one another in very specific, sometimes paired ways. Um, their closure belies that interdependence um, with that specific external structure, perhaps a continent away upon which it's, it relies for energy, purpose, and support. For example, um, Apple's spaceship campus in Cupertino, also foster, where design and strategy live, cannot possibly exist without the Foxconn factory uh, campuses in Shenzhen, where Apple's products are assembled from parts into perfected slabs that tether us to the cloud. Even as occupying different corners of the globe and selectively ignorant of what goes on on the other site, the two megastructures are intimately paired. The two share a unique bond across the strange distances of the mega urban network, binding them together in ways that both permeate the solidity of their total envelopes and by revealing the interdependence with the exterior world, as well as by doubling, mimicking one envelope into another, Foxconn's fences and suicide nets become Apple's apricot fields. Foxconn's dorms become Apple's subterranean parking. Foxconn's massive assembly lines become Apple's customer service protocols, and together these two megastructures, along with the network of retail store embassies, constitute the territorial urbanicity of the Apple Cloud platform itself. But their relationship may rest on a symbiosis that is more fragile than it might appear. Like the Eloy and Morlock from H.G. Wells' Time Machine, the megastructured's two paired populations share the same world but inhabit different spaces. One above ground, the other underneath. One living in the perpetual innocence of play and leisure, experience, design, innovation, oblivious or uninterested in how it all appears for them every morning. The other running the machine underneath, toiling against the earth, forcing it to produce the bounty over and again. And it is perhaps a bad omen for Cupertino that the bargain between the subterranean world of the Morlocks and the surface world of the Eloy is maintained only because periodically do the Morlocks harvest Eloy like cattle and eat them. The cannibal economies between networks of megastructures is not always what they first appear. Okay, I want to then shift gears a little bit. We'll do a Q&A and discussion in the rest of it when we're, when we're all done here as well. Um, my intention is, and I want to, my intention is this to uh, focus on the, this dynamic of oscillation between the utopian and the dystopian that the megastructural form seems to demand of us. So my intention is not to end on some, um, is end on the dystopian note, but to, um, is to focus on that convertibility. Uh, and the interest is to hopefully revive a design interest in the possibility, again, of thinking social totality, of thinking territorial totality as a basic condition by which some kind of renewed subtractive modernity might begin itself. It's not, a, my position in, the, in no ways is, is, is in no sense should be regarded as anti-megastructural, quite the opposite, the opposite. All right, I wanna then, I wanna end by reading you a story. A story called the role of megastructure in the eschatology of John Fromm. I mean, we just go black if that's probably all right here as well on the picture. The role of megastructure in the eschatology of John Frum uh, on OMA's master plan for the Spratly Islands. Is it possible to do black instead of blue? It's a bit more. Thank you. 
All right. This is, by the way, from a book of mine that just came out called Dispute Plan to Prevent Future Luxury Constitution, um, which we'll be reading more of in the seminar as well. All right. September 30th, 2001. The South Pacific Island, which some simply call the ocean, is composed by an indefinite and perhaps infinite number of geometric configurations with vast plains of salt water in between surrounding very low carpets of sand. Among these are the Spratly Islands, claimed by no less than seven countries, China, Malaysia, the Philippines, Brunei, Indonesia, Vietnam, and Taiwan. From any of the Spratlys, one can see on the interminable horizon the upper and lower registers of Chinese hegemony. The distribution of the populations is variable. 20,000 migrants in five languages per port these are the land-bound sociologies. The height of their buildings from floor to ceiling scarcely exceeds that of a normal bookcase. One of the, un one of the occupied archipelagos leads to a narrower chain of micronations, which opens up onto another floating plateau of scientific equipment monitoring in real time, the metagenomics of plankton, each device identical to the first and all to the rest. To the left and right of the archipelago, there are the otherwise identical capital buildings of two defunct kingdoms, one called the Kingdom of Humanity. In the left, the appointed legislature was known to work and sleep standing up, to the right, sitting to satisfy their fecal necessities. Between the two capitals, above ground, winds winds a spiral staircase, which today sags abysmally overhead in some places and soars upward to remote distances in others, consuming a sunburnt canopy. In the hallway of the overhead stairway between the two, there is a non-reversing mirror that reflects all personal appearances so that, it's, so that its viewer sees oneself as truly seen by others and not the lateral inversion presented by the normal mirror. Anthropologists have inferred from the positioning of the mirror that the still ongoing decay of the dual indigenous kingdoms is to be taken as a profound measure of their success. If it were not, why this requirement to make the illusion of reflection more optically accurate? I prefer to dream that its dirty fingerprint smudge surface represents and promises another absolute reversibility. Working instead working itself out through an architectural drama of legal authority situated as funereal diorama. Inside the equally dark twin royal chambers, artificial light is provided by glowing plastic fruits that in no way resemble lamps. In each room, separated by the sagging above ground stairway, there are two of these transversely placed. The light they emit is insufficient, flickering, and loud. July 10th, 2006. This trip to Java is to collect research for a chapter that I will write for a volume edited by colleagues in London on, quote, transnational theology and political violence, unquote. My contribution will analyze the 2002 Bali nightclub bombings and, and whatever I'm able to assess as the current state of things in this, the largest Muslim country in the world. My hypothesis, at least as I set foot on the ground, had to do with one, the Pacific effects of Sufi mysticism on Wahhabism's still tenuous foothold here, and two, the role and character of the many English Bahasa Indonesian websites and online forums that operate parallel to the official civic space of the mosques. The editors have managed to cover my expenses with a cultural grant from an official at the Dutch consulate in New York who grew up in Indonesia in the years after its independence and therefore still considers the island chain to be part to be within the expanded portfolio of the Netherlands diplomatic mission. Tomorrow I will interview some of the remaining relatives and colleagues of the spiritual agent of the Bali attacks, Abdul Aziz, better known as Iman Sa Sa Samudra. I have read the Google translated version of his Aku uh, Melawan Terroris, I Fight Terrorists, his autobiography and Jihadist Manifesto, which became a bestseller across Indonesia during his trial. My, ed my editors once considered translating long sections of it to include in the volume, but the prose was so arid and self-aggrandizing that to do so seemed like an additional act of violence in its own right. 
Today, however, other news has arrived. Beijing's new master plan for the Spratly Islands is to be designed by the Rotterdam-based studio Office for Metropolitan Architecture, OMA, known in China and Indonesia mostly for its iconic CCTV headquarters and its burned-out homunculus, the Mandarin Hotel. Local analysis of the news is fretful. The Jakarta Post writes, quote, the Chinese occupation of the Spratly Islands was never completely unexpected, but as valid territorial claims had been made on them by so many different sovereign states, the sheer scale of planned development must be seen as well beyond the worst case scenarios feared by Manila or Jakarta, unquote. The New Straits Times adds, quote, the U.S. State Department loudly identified the conflict over the Spratleys as a potential trigger point for military action in the region as far back as the 1980s and did so again with a widely published pronouncement on the danger in 2004, unquote. When I was first in Indonesia in the mid-1990s, I learned how unambiguously the Spratleys represented, even as a symbol untethered from real geographical experience, they are seldom visited by civilians, a trembling fear of Chinese regional hegemony and the physical force thereof. One journalist spoke to me of, of that force with words that translated as volcano, sun, and earthquake. The other Americans squatting in Jakarta hotel bars were quick with predictions, but all seemed to have forgotten that it was our military that divided up the ocean's islands into provisions and micronations in the wake of the wars in the Pacific theater. It was a foregone conclusion that there would be a showdown of some sort, uh, fought over the naval glacis or with the slow martial arts of mixed-use development. Perhaps China versus the other, six, the other six claimants combined. But what about Japan? Should China prevail, it was prophesied, then ultimately no claim on sovereign geography anywhere in Asia could truly be guaranteed. Even with such momentous expectations, none of them could have or indeed did not foresee what would ultimately result from China's ongoing capitalization, this megastructure. July 12th, 2006. I'm awake with jet lag, well past dawn. My research notes scattered and plastered across the ornate, oversized hotel room, adding to the neo-miscellaneous decor. I'm days early from my first meetings and find it impossible to focus on my writing or on, or on mentally reconstructing mentally reconstructing the Manichaean politico-theological zeitgeist of 2002. The Spratly Project is an, inter is, an in is an interrupting omen. To clarify, I'm able to write these notes because I've just received a copy of the OMA project and proposal book as presented to select members of the Chinese press and I assume to the actual clients. It must weigh 10 pounds. The sender is a former American student of mine who now works in OMA's Beijing office. In a seminar in Los Angeles, we had studied OMA's strategic use of programmatic diagrams as political narrative, particularly the generative section, and he was anxious to pass along the new, the, this new major example to me, a mentor of sorts, I suppose. As the enormous envelope arrived in my hotel, and as I signed for the parcel from a, from a courier ominously accompanied by security personnel, I felt like I was receiving secure military documents or drugs, smuggled, smuggled cryptographic munitions, secret invasion plans. The thing is, to many here in Jakarta, this giant book may well have been just that. To my student, it was an expert souvenir to show that he had made good. Despite the fact that this country grows so much of the world's coffee supply, it's difficult to get a good cup, even in an upscale hotel, but I'm grateful for the adrenaline anyway. The book opens with a long and precise essay on the anthropological, geologic, and military histories of the Spratly Islands, followed by a comprehensive portfolio of images of other ambitious megastructures, both realized and speculative, Buckminster Fuller, Tetland's Tower, the Palace of the Soviets, Hoover Dam, Super Studio, Rainer Banham, and finally, the Great Wall of Foxconn. OMA, quote, OMA's current proposed master plan for the archipelago chain of islands must be understood in the context of this history, which this project closely acknowledges, unquote. The project book goes on, some 500 oversized horizontal pages in girth, and I'm shocked to see that it touches on some of the very same reference material as the research that currently brought me to Indonesia. 
I cannot fathom how this data may have factored into Beijing's ultimate decision to greenlight this enormous investment. The second chapter states, quote, the skull map now on display in Saigon mimics the infamous map of skulls drawn from the Tuol Slang Museum at the former high school in Phnom Penh, which had been used as security prison 21 during the Khmer Rouge reign of terror, unquote. This gruesome installation of anti-Chinese propaganda is dutifully debunked by OMA to underscore their client's true sovereign claim, not only on the islands, but on the entire ecosystem in their midst as well. I didn't share any of this with the student. Um, that was for a different time. As the OMA book makes sardonically plain, Vietnamese claims regarding the island's historical habitation from the Lê dynasty uh, to the present are factually baseless. The lay people are not only, uh, not only unrepresented by the current inhabitants, they actually never existed. Regardless of the inter international community's policy positions on the ultimate geoethics of Beijing and Hong Kong's new developments there, the proposition cannot be seriously entertained. This is, quote, that the tens of thousands of supposedly dead and disappeared islanders could have been killed by Chinese occupation because it's unlikely that the islands were actually, that were actually uh, inhabited at that time at all, unquote. OMA's conclusion, the map of the Spratleys composed with the skulls of those lay people supposedly killed by Chinese and Japanese occupations now on display in Saigon must be constructed with the heads of dead people from somewhere else. This was my hypothesis too. The designers armed the clients with the necessary rationale to deflect opposition from both those directly affected by the plans and those with exterior cosmopolitan intentions. Traffic is light today, and the internet seems almost unencumbered. I take the opportunity to execute some lingering errands. I leave the OMA program book locked up at my hotel. The sky is pink and brown, and the waterway smells like old airplanes. The taxis like durian perfume. I feel settled and calm. July 4th, July, July 14th, 2006. My contacts who were to arrange today's meetings with Imam Samundra's remaining network seem uh, send word that everything has been postponed, all bets off, or, quote, not to worry, but don't tell anyone, unquote, they relay. That night, on the way to dinner uh, in, the, in the Petam Buran area, I see graffiti in English on garage doors, on the sides of delivery vans, reading, John from. It occurs to me that I, had been see that I had been seeing it in Bahasa, but didn't know it at the time as well. The faint parallel lines between my current assignment, the nightclub bombing, and what, may have, what, what I have been reading over in the last day in the OMA project book evidently makes me nervous and sad. There are islands and there are islands, but the two are often confused. This confusion drove the whole Dutch East India project, you could argue. Alone at my table overlooking the street, I remember feeling more than a bit ambivalent, conflicted, and eventually drunk on bintangs. Quote, it's extremely unlikely that in one hour I say out loud to no one, the conclusion that I have been imagined will prove that the real cause of the Bali bombing was not anti-Americanism, despite the apostolic claims of the perpetrators, but an anti-Chinese hostility that, on Java, mixed with local ethnic rivalry, with day-to-day -day civilizational eschatology. Over tea, I review my own notes writ 10 weeks before on the main opposition movement to the Chinese mobilization of the Spratleys. It says, which doesn't invalidate interest in new, in new John Frum party that has made these retroactive irredentist claims, but rather amplifies it. An inverse messianism seeks to re repeal a South Pacific occupation in the name of island culture that quite literally never physically existed. The John Frum party has long since spread from its cargo called Origins on Vanuatu around World War II. Isaac Juan Nikau Jr.'s presence in Pacific politics has made February 15th the old John Frum day of his imminent return, synonymous with anti-Chinese popular sentiment from Macau to Midway. How many different recipes are there for the tragic history of marginalized, colonized peoples to mix ad hoc geopolitics, populist spiritualism to service the specter of some pre-colonial original culture?
not that many. The origin of origins. The body of that specter is a culture that can be venerated as purified only through such convolutions as a projective plan for another post-post-colonial political constitution. The convolutions are the present, of the present say, we shall be what we once were. Atavism as telos. But what other examples are there of the irredentist projection and formation, and in the case of the skull map, literal counterfeiting of a peoples that are neither subjugated nor annihilated by genocide, but who archaeologically speaking never existed in the first place? I close my book. On the back of my newspaper, I draw out my own sketches of what the OMA project would, will look like when complete, based on the initial descriptions of the project's book's essay. I wonder how different this will be from the official renders I've that I have been deliberately avoided looking at. From the Jakarta Post, quote, while Brunei will keep its dozen or so exclusive economic zones and Vietnam will retain fishing access across a nearly 50,000 square kilometer area, China's consolidation of these satellite holdings will be essentially complete, unquote. In essence, OMA confronts the territorial spread of the Spratly 750 to 1,000 islands and sea mounts Instead of attempting to, quote, resolve the geographic and jurisdictional complexities of the islands, they will instead directly merge them into an artificial mega archipelago. The islands themselves are already spread out across three different natural archipelagos, not formed by a single geolog a geologic breaking of the Pacific surface, and so the sprinkling of land above is matched by a fragmentation of this foundation beneath. Even the scattering of land on water is itself a broken foundation beneath. I outline figures and numbers and calculations, one on top of another, seeing if it all adds up, even on its own terms. Beneath the water, above the water, the scheme is both brilliant and absurd. By characterizing the annual disappearance of low-lying low -lying sea mounts and the eventual subtraction of much of the land from the map due to climate change and due sea rise, OMA claims that expertise drawn from its Netherlands national history of territorial production and defense and use, and, and, and use, original, and, and use of original um, uh, Dutch terminologies. The project will essentially invert the figure ground tableau of pebbles floating on water with two essential moves. One, further carving the already small islands into equal sized standardized units in some cases giving the rocky interiors the now deeply, of, the, of the now deeply striated terrains back to the ocean, thereby making their nodal arrangement more flexible and manageable. And two, linking these units into a multi-directional grid both under and over the rising sea level. This scaffolding will provide, it is hoped, a kind of oceanic canopy through which the new production and distribution initiatives can draw on the island's considerable but inaccessible oil and gas reserves, serve the freight, cruise, seasteading, and seasteading traffic, and also effectively house the hundreds of thousands of new inhabitants to be imported from the mainland. The strategy is, is, is in marked contrast to those of other competing proposals which had, it would eat, that had, each in their own way, attempted to address the seven-headed claims of sovereignty over the Spratleys with either an architecture of polynational equanimity a sort of seaborne United Nations chamber in the round, or one of absolute Chinese consolidation. The Beijing Bay Studio MAD would have fused Sinkau Island with a close neighbor with a several kilometer long concrete peninsula that would invoke Tiananmen Square itself, as the portraits of Mao may have done during an earlier time. Unappeasable. My room is black and blue and the pillow feels so cold and dry on my face. The work will have to find its own way as usual. I assume my editors will not only understand, but will also welcome the new directions, more than they have paid for, if they can step along with it and even see where they are going. The muddy light of wall-mounted lamps leading toward and up the paired staircases was the same as in the beginning, both head down into the same ocean, but from different entry points, both lead back, back up but toward different exits, there is no reason to assume that one has to be the other. This is what made it possible over these hundreds of years to formulate something like a general theory of the formless and chaotic nature of the island's intricate and shallow political stakes. Every sensible line is not a straightforward statement, 
and there are leagues of senseless cacophonies and symbolic jumbles and misunderstandings and unadorned brutalities and incredible violence. None of it and all of it is encrypted. And it's still right there without veil or explanation or justification. The light is formulated by the dead who one supposes could be staying at the hotel at this very moment viewing together the slums that will become the parking garage and then a slum again later this year, writing the present state of humans and things and phantoms in the distance in the districts where young men would once again prostrate themselves is what they do, kissing pages and turning in certain directions at certain times. There's nothing really for them to decipher per se. What's the wrong word as it turns out? It's all the epidemics, all the fake heresies, the warlords from the television. Perhaps I'm just old enough to deceive myself, but I think the whole lot is about to be burned alive without the archive enduring it, utterly corruptible. The same ideas and images as before, just as I had dreamed, that its fingerprint smudged surfaces can point to another absolute reversibility working itself out through theaters of authorities, set pieces, and stage sets, and through the shadow puppetry and the twin chambers illuminated still by fruit, with all the rooms divided by elevators and stairways, the grinding hum they emit like the sound of people talking. July, 5th, July 15th, 2006. Today's new John Frum movement has never actually threatened to use bombs to disrupt Chinese development on the Spratleys, but has explicitly linked this choice to their opposition to the French nuclear test that first brought them to the world's attention. OMA's analysis also makes succinct and clear correlation between Frum's history, the bomb tactic, and the planned future of the island chain. OMA presumes that the namesake John Frum must have been one of the many American infantry who occupied Vanuatu during World War II and who may have had an important role in, his, in the clearing of the islands, in building the many cargo and troop landing strips, or has been suggested in the actual distribution of real cargo to the troops or to the islanders, as if he had some mastery over the appearance of these. John from Kansas, John from, or whatever, however. However, given the extensive cargo cult landing strips that the, Ven that the Venetuans built after the war, ostensibly to coerce the skies to land more cargo and from which might require John Frum to return in order to manage the sacred logistics. The alternative hypothesis is that Frum was not a Westerner at all, unlike the Prince Philip cults, but was himself an Atuian and appeared at well before the war, promising not a return of American or Japanese bounty, but a cleansing of all outsiders from the island. Only then would the islanders be able to amass their own true wealth the bounty brought by the Americans suggested that this was imminent, even if it meant suffering their presence for a while. Today, the From graffiti is directly tied to the potential bombing campaign, which the movement articulates in rich prophetic detail, but which, but which never, but never explicitly links uh, in relation to the Spratlys, uh, as this would get them included on official lists of terrorist organizations. Bomb quote unquote, is instead presented as a symbol of the from political theology of irredentist cleansing, which in turn is how the Spratley's problem is framed by the movement for its widespread audience and sympathizers. No direct threats are made, but the chain of pedantic association is unmistakable. And instead of playing down the from threat, as other competing studios did during their, to calm the nerves of Chinese officials who had indiscreetly let it be known that they saw the scope of the development as a security risk, OMA instead played it up and used it to their advantage. The flat lattice would connect the hundreds of regularized specks of land into a vast network having the effect of, an increase, of increasing ha inhabitable space by several orders of magnitude. It was, they argued, the only way to establish the development a development capable of sustaining the scale of logistics programming that the project demanded without also providing clear monuments, symbolic icons, and critical choke points that if Bond would provide the new John Frum party or indeed any other anti-Chinese entity from Taiwanese to independence groups to the open internet activists, a clear point of leverage. Quote, defense through obscurity and obscurity through decentralization. 
OMA repeats, without typical irony, the apocryphal example of early to mid-1970s U.S. Internet, which linked points between U California and Utah and the SAGE er air bomber early warning system architecture on which it was based, as a network topology that would provide massive redundancy if ever attacked. The story goes that if the Soviets were to bomb any one node, then the surviving nodes would han would, could handle the rerouted traffic. The principle is basically sound, as, and, uh, and as is true of neural networks, it is also as it is of shipping lanes, but the historical example is inaccurate. Nevertheless, OMA explicitly applied this defensive topology for the master plan and in doing so assured the Chinese that they could continue to build and expand the development as they wished without fear of terrorist attack. Not because it was an impenetrable bunker, but because no single tower fallen could strategically or symbolically affect the claims that the from, might, might, the from party might hope to, hope to make with such an attack. It would be a centerless city with no absolute critical points and one could easily subtract attack zones from its self-healing program, effectively making the, quote, bomb visions of the new John Frum party preemptively irrelevant. It is starting to think that, it is starting to think that this rationale may have helped to finalize the allocation of tens of billions of dollars to construct an artificial archipelago in the South China Sea, startling. It is disturbing for its jaundiced and schematic view of history and for the hubris and cynicism with which it assigns a role for architecture in the governance of these processes. Unlike the Bali bombers, the new John Frum party's initial interest in the Spratleys was not rooted in the regional politics of countermanaging China or in China's bullying of its neighbors. As indicated, it became visible as a, as a leading voice in the outcry among South Pacific nations over France's 1995 atmospheric testing of nuclear bombs near Tahiti, about six, six, roughly 6,000 kilometers east of Vanuatu, another 6,000 kilometers east of the Spratleys. The OMA project book does mention this, and its citation of the event in this particular context is both surprising and provocative in ways that raise the stakes on what is to be won by their megastructural intervention. It is not just about defensibility. The bomb, small or large, has been a technique of the state, of its formation and its deformation for centuries. In my own research for the essay I, I came here, that I came here to write, did my student read this work? Did I mention it to him? It's pretty impossible, actually, I think. I had linked the Tahiti nuclear test to moments in this Janus-faced career of the bomb as a means for state authority to carve itself into space, as well as the otherwise uncontrolled violent refusal of that same authorization. The rain stops, or perhaps it stopped a while ago. I search for and reread the relevant sections from my older drafts, quote, on July, f July 25th, 1995, a small handmade bomb ripped through the Saint-Michel RER station, killing several and turned the center of Paris into a temporary triage zone. Responsibility for the attack was ultimately claimed by several Islamist groups in retaliation for the French cancellation of the 1990 elections in Algeria, which saw religious fundamentalist groups defeat the French and military-backed civilian parties, but which disallowed them from ever taking power, unquote. I compare the two documents. The project book states that, quote, the bomb in Paris represented an attack not just on the specific French state to meddle in the affairs of its, of its former African colonies, but upon the authority of any state, as opposed to religious law, to legitimately organize the affairs of a society, unquote. This could have been lifted from my own text. Quote, to attack the authority of secular governmentality itself, the bomb was placed at the center of the center, the middle of Paris, the capital city, a violent profanation of the, of the secular sacred space of the state, unquote. But the trajectory of the terrorist architectonics works equally for the state as against it. OMA links the RER bombs to the nuclear tests, quote, almost simultaneous to this employment of the micro explosives as a technology for spatial erasure of the French state was the deployment of macro explosives for the reiteration of the state's authority to possess authority at all and to ascribe itself upon the terror blah, 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 and they cannot connect it up, though. Quote, later in the fall, after the Paris bombs, between September 1995 and January 1996, to be exact, in a particularly nasty return of the Gaullist project of Francophone nuclear sovereignty, the waning Mitterrand regime exploded several nuclear test bombs over the Mororo atolls in the South Pacific, unquote. 
OMA then goes on to quote the new John Frum party's own breathless analysis of the French explosions, which, which is still published in a weird translation on the movement's website dated 1997. Quote, the role of the bomb to authorize both of the governments and the true soldiers from Hiroshima to the World Trade Center contain multiples of contradictory functions in the name of defending the military discreteness of the Western state, which in another form trips over itself in haste to dissolve itself into Euro capital, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, unquote. I think they mean to here to refer to the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. The 1995 atomic tests were met with protests in the Pacific from across the political spectrum, and nearby Papiti was rocked by weeks of waves of riots. But in France, the nuclear tests were covered in the French media by perfunctory, matter-of-fact announcements in both public and privately controlled media. The message of the tests was a straightforward declaration of the right of the French state to make declarations on its own behalf, on behalf of its independence, and a singular capacity to act as a state, as a collective agent in a world governed by states, as opposed to corporations or religions. The uneventfulness and take it for grantedness was exactly the point. Meanwhile, at the same time, on September 29th, 1995, Khalid Kakal, the 21-year-old Franco-Algerian suspected of being the bag man in the Saint Michel RER bombing, was gunned down, kicked, and shot again on live television, many times over if you count the assessment replays. July 17th, 2006. I answer a knock on the door. My breakfast on a huge, loud tray underneath a giant tablecloth topped by the International Herald Tribune like a flat bow. I see that another public decent decency trial spellbinds Singapore. Another mail bomb has gone off in Kuala Lumpur, again in a travel agency, and that somehow, and for possibly sinister reasons, bacon was again added to my order. Who is the wholesaler of bacon in the largest Muslim country in the world? There's another knock on the door, and I think about not answering it. The porter hands me a huge stack of newspapers. I must have asked for these at some point to check on the coverage and reaction to the Spratly Padraig, but I don't remember. I check my email and find a long, weirdly informal letter from my former student. It goes, you have to understand that Rem completely understands how this project is being received in Jakarta. You must have read some scary things. You have, you have to understand that he practically grew up in Indonesia. He moved there when he was like seven years old, which must be 1952 or so. So he saw the country being born after its independence from the Dutch, which meant his own father. Imagine how that would affect your thinking about the world if you were a little kid. I think it really shaped him in this project, whether you can believe it or not. It, I think the project is part of him dealing with that and, how, and, and dealing with that and what has to be done in another way. I don't know what the Chinese think, and, and, and definitely Rem is suspicious. I mean, come on. This project may seem too ambitious, but really it's not. It'll work in ways that I'm sure the people who are, who are so scared can't possibly imagine. Look, sometimes he goes too far. He's the first one to admit it. He goes on repeating everything I already know from reading the project book and then draws analogies between certain maneuvers and ideas that he first encountered in my writing, apologetically, enthusiastically, then he repeats himself in regular centripetal patterns until the, letter, until the letter ends. And my stomach sinks. As an, as an add-on, he nonchalantly discloses something that I didn't know and I'm certain is not widely known regarding an earlier late 1970s incarnation of OMA and their involvement in a planning project that was sponsored in some way by the French-Algerian financiers backing the Khmer Rouge and brokered by the infamous Thai French attorney Jacques Verge. He hints at this and moves on. It's, it's all too much. It's not a conspiracy. It's a revelation of childhood abuse. The email ends with an invitation for me to attend the groundbreaking ceremony in the Spratleys as a supervising dignitary. If you can keep your head when others are losing theirs, the skull map, I close my eyes and press my fingertips into my eyelids, which watching, watching the spiky flickers trickle and trail across the warm insides, breathing slowly and concentrating on them as they move closer and further away in their own miniature cosmos. I hope to fall into their zigzagging descents. July 18th, 2006. I can barely sleep at all for the third night in a row. I dream of elephants staring at me as I hover above them like a helicopter waves of tall green grass blowing violently all around them. 
There's still no word from my supposed contacts. I decide to allow myself to fully unfold the oversized map of the project's artificial archipelago because it's a hot pink dawn again. And so I slide everything off the table and onto the, in my hotel room onto the carpet. The massive network of curves stretches from one end of South China Sea to the next, a circulation pattern of permanent inhabitants, temporary workers, and temporary executives, the data packets flowing through the structure's huge capacity of fiber optic cables, the logistics of real goods, internal and external transportation, the tracking of paper dollars and yuan near in near field communication systems. Everything is modeled by complex fluid dynamics, measurements, equations, incomprehensible maths, annotate the fractal soap bubble composition. I read all the flows, human and inhuman, have been simulated with Langarian and Eulerian equations to an un unreasonable and absurd level of confidence and predictive granularity. And all of these design issues are largely, all of these design issues are largely initial state problems, and so this degree of simulated prediction and control cannot possibly be real. On the page, it is math as heraldry. Architectural programs are both strictly partitioned and promiscuously interwoven. Euclidean and hyperbolic geometries collapsing upon one another, container sorting, manufacturing and assembly, long-term asset storage, banking and data services all coexist with resorts and prisons. They are arranged in an inspired and desolate combination of maniacal algorithmic precision and totally arbitrary cynicism. The artificial archipelago's fuzzy topos is based on research by, in global internet packet routing by Dmitry Kurokov. His work models hyperbolic distances in packet routing across the Earth's surface and confounds commonsensical relationships between nodes and the tangled lattice of cyber infrastructure and traditional national geography. Sometimes the shortest distance between two points is determined by a smart packet heading in what appears at first to be the opposite direction from its intended recipient. Legacy networks essentially required, required putting a kind of map of the entire internet space into every router, such that each believes itself to be aware of the entire network at once. There's the address tables require constant updating, and as a whole, each router is asked to perpetually overthink the optimum path of every packet entrusted to it. But Kurikov's device an ingeniously simple method of giving a sense of direction to the lowly individual packet itself such that even the simplest unit of information doesn't need to know its ultimate career in advance of being sent, and no gateway needs to recalculate the itinerary of every message it shuttles. Packets move in the general direction of their destinations, however global or local that generality may be when they are far away from it or nearby to it. The results of these two modifications, hyperbolic versus Euclidean distances and building, quote, greedy pathfinding, into individual packets could realize perhaps an order of magnitude increase in the global data throughput should such ideas be fully and properly intimated, implemented. As it stands today, only a fraction of publicly accessible networks use these methods to their potential, though most large corporations' infrastructures, including Google's own internal networks, have been based at least partially on Kirikov's methods for some time. I myself know next to nothing about it. OMA's essential insights are, one, to treat the master plan of the Spratly Ar Artificial Archipelago as a regional state megastructure network capable of intensive amputation and regrowth. Two, to treat the distribution of human program and non-human program as interchangeable packet layers. Three, to imbue packets with precise quantum of sovereign mobility. Four, to privilege the geometries of hyperbolic distances in ways practical over all Euclidean distances. Five, to elevate this privilege to an ordinal principle of militarily defensible physical and political geography. More knocks, more breakfast, more newspapers, more bacon, no word from the contacts. The Bali bombers' remaining Confederates are not enthusiastic to account for themselves in an interview, I guess. The court cases are too complicated and they are already turning on each other. Uniformly fragmented island atolls are rendered by dynamite into standard size unit positions in a grid and installed into another new ordered oceanic surface. Hotel shower and hotel toilet, hotel sink, hotel bed, and the South China Sea. Plankton are captured and their genomic evolution is modeled in real time against the master image of climate variation. The project's most iconic images are Poincaré geodesics and half plane models 
those fractal soap bubbles, again, scaling infinitely dense or opening upon whatever edge they are pressed. Now there is, quote, third order heptagonal tiling, unquote, where before there was only ground plate and water and old military maps and naive naval zones crisscrossing the island spread. As the ethics of material and materialism, this grid is absorbed and reprocessed into what it had been all along, undernoticed, that is, an ambition less for the line than for the knot and for its avoidance. July 28, 2006. The stupidly methodical tasks of writing and of editing distract me from the present state of things and from how they are designed and governed for real. I'm certain that everything I might try to communicate would quickly negate itself or turn on its subject, in, subject matter into a pun. I read the words on my page, quote, I know of places where young men prostrate themselves before old buildings and kiss their surfaces in an unsettling manner, but they do not know how to open a single door. Outbreaks, sarcastic heresies for generations which inevitably de degenerate into sophistry have decimated the populations there. I try not to spend too much time writing about suicide bombing more and more frequent with the years because others have jealously staked it out as their territory for interpretation, unquote. Perhaps a postponed but inevitable exhaustion confuses me. But even if the human species is about to be extinguished, the project supposedly will endure. Illuminated, solitary, geometrically infinite, perfectly motionless in its speed, equipped with precious volumes of useless and inaccessible secrets, the new international terminal at Socarno Airport is quiet and sunny, an enclave of abstraction and the serene mobilities it promises. Like all enclaves, it's a version of utopia. Pre-boarding for departure is announced and we self-segregate according to our relationship to the mode of mobilization, ceremoniously repeating in miniature the procedures of the outside world to which we owe our presence. Into a new blank document file, I have just written the word impossible. I have not pulled this adjective out of rhetorical habit, but looking back from some perspective on its ultimate demise, is it illogical to think that the world is itself impossible? Those who would advertise counter arguments about, be about, about being are also those who postulate that for all the places close at hand, the corridors and stairways and axonometric he hexagons cannot justify us to ourselves because they are too far away and too foreign and not of the here and the now. Those who make such claims are worse, much worse. And then what? Is it possible that the number of combinations of these systems has no limit, that a site condition has no ecological purchase ultimately? I hope to plot a solution to this someday and instead to ask, is the Turing machine heavier than the airplane of imminence? neither unlimited nor cynical. If a perpetual tourist were to cross it by ship in any and all directions after centuries, he would see that the same architectures were repeated in the same disorder, which thus repeated would be in order, perhaps the order. My insomnia is soothed by this hope. Just before taxiing onto the runway, I scan one last email from my former student and includes clippings from a Beijing-based website documenting spect spectral appearances of, quote, kolhas, at the construction site, wrapped in dark glasses, hidden behind officials, barely, barely visible to cameras. In later posts, he is shown in white face, arms waving above his head in incantation. In fact, many such figures are lined up, one after the other, each in a white suit, in white face paint, black sunglasses, and posing with the workers. Is this from? My student continues to speculate on Kolhas's childhood in Indonesia, his possible daily routines, his hobbies, traumas, July 28th, 2007. This carnivalesque satire of the belly of the architect is not the only form of grotesque realism that the project could endure or enforce or withstand or perpetuate. Its mania and rigor could not immunize it from being reframed by counter narratives. You are familiar, I think, with the documentary Archipel uh, Capualan. Besides the obvious, the film was another unusual and uncomfortable link to the messianic irredentism of the John from, New John Frum party. Frumis claimed that some of the workers shown in this film crushed underneath collapsed building sites, thrown off boats into the sea, stacked like fish in floating prison hospitals, 
dismembered by sport for, by bored drunk construction workers are themselves descendants of the long original lay islanders. W would that it were so. In fact, most of the laborers depicted, variously working, smiling, or dying, are from the territories of Sarawak and Madura, as the film reveals despite itself. From his websites, freely used collage snippets from the film as source material in the creation of fantasy terrorist attack scenarios, edited into often lavish short vi videos and distributed openly on American and Russian social media sites. These sorts of quasi-fact, quasi-fictional fantasy attack plots, a hack genre known as Bojinka, make extensive use of Archipel Kapulawan as cornerstone source footage. So while the film makes no reference to from theology, and in fact the filmmakers have now disavowed any association, the film nevertheless is a canonical resistance text for the movement and continues to circulate through informal networks of hand-traded flash drives, or so I'm told. I didn't encounter any such thing myself, but I'm possibly the last stranger in the city who is likely to be entrusted with the reception of such a thing. Except for the dozens of new and old airstrips striding the sporadic open lands and the largely symbolic megastructural troop barracks that Brunei has used to ensure its EEZ claims, the Spratly Islands look much like they have for decades, and in most areas as they have for centuries. Despite the violent scope of the project plans, today the archipelago is still remote and largely lifeless and empty of buildings Renders from OMA's master plan already adorn the covers of new Mandarin language tourist guidebooks and fill up multiple different user-generated layers on Google Earth. The now iconic hyperbolic lattice system, both submerged and above water, has already been repurposed in Second Life, the new criterion of architectural cliche. The skull map of the lost lay people on display in Saigon, however surely counterfeit, is at least tangible and physical. It's a real fraud, not a fraudulent real. Construction on the OMA project has been delayed for three years as of now, and it's uncertain when, indeed, ever, the project will be fully undertaken and completed as planned. Baseline projections on sea level rise with high degree of predictive certainty all but assured that 10 to 15% of the island land will be underwater by the end of the next century. And while the most extreme projections presume presume the exponential climatic effects of multiple positive feedback loops amplifying one another could put that closer to 20 to 30 percent. China's absorption of the Spratleys into a new logistical exocontinent along with OMA's sy synthetic topology may only succeed to the extent that they can also provide for adaptation to ecological transformations that cannot be realistically predicted before construction begins, an, initio an initial value problem once again. If this is so, then the project may be an ingenious solution to a very different situation than the one to which it was originally assigned. Or equally possible, it can be recommended on its own account, even before its own completion, as an exotic ruin of failed governance and regional superpower overreach. Nevertheless, it has already succeeded as a geopolitical ploy through the sheer presumption of momentum to silence the competing sovereign claims over the Spratly Islands by neighboring countries. Malaysia has even formally recognized the entire chain now as part of China's extended territory based in essence on the presumption that the OMA plan is the inevitable future of the archipelago. And so even before the megastructure is built, it already is so. August 11th, 2008. I did eventually meet with the acquaintances of Iman Samandura, introduced to them indirectly by contacts made with Frumis groups interested in having their side told through me, a channel that they mistook as a Dutch journalist. We disappointed each other, I'm sure. At the time, it was hoped that some insight into basic mysteries of the social, the archaic origin of the state, and the, and the time of geography, perhaps, might be found. It is or is not coincidental that these grave concerns could be demonstrated as and through architecture. If the language of the stone is not sufficient, then the multiform plan and the solemn grid will have produced the diagram. Since the Japanese surrender on board the USS Missouri, nearby designers, politicians, and terrorist functionaries have contested the plan. They are the official actors of sorts, supposedly utterly unrelated in purpose, but before, during, and after my interviews with them, they all present themselves to me in the exact same way. They are all opponents 
who have become one and the same through the friendship with their inverted, interwoven paranoias. I've witnessed them in the commitment of their purpose. They appear exhausted by their work. They recount by way of endless footnotes within footnotes of renewed commitments to personal and collective purification and to communities and interactions to come that will, by way of their divine anonymous violence, resolve the constitutional contradictions of the ongoing stalemate of the unbuilt project that may hold the key. They talk with their admirers of good works to come, and sometimes they spend hours picking aimlessly through their feeds, looking for some bit of information that will inspire and inaugurate their next move tomorrow morning. They scan for critical events. Obviously, no one expects such people to build anything or to tear anything down, and yet their project is, at least partially, already finished by now. As was to be expected, Mania is followed by flamboyant depression. Some means, some practical violence of the state or against the state for the project or against the project, somewhere, somehow, would turn the tide in their favor. They each invariably conclude. In the end, a small blasphemous from sect originally from Midway suggested that the opposition should cease and, and that all islanders, including the Chinese engineers and the Dutch and British and American architects, should jumble the plan all together until they have constructed, by the probabilities of fate and chance, another megastructure that would absorb the intentions of Beijing, as well as the eschatological promissory aspirations of the new John Frum party, into one. Quote, can this not be Babel, they ask optimistically, in not so many words. The Chinese issued damning orders on them, as did the mainstream from resistance. This sect, the last of them, disappeared, at least from my view. On occasion, I have seen what I take to be their scribbled graffiti, wasting away in the public comment section, sections of the project's waning journalistic coverage. Despite their sense of doom and defeat, in many ways, this is their true solution, at least to what is most important to them, which, in reality, has prevailed. Their composite tower will be built, and with time, theirs will be that which is honored by decay. Thanks.